His number is in the rafters at Duke University. He's guarded the likes of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the NBA, but his most important work is coming off the court. We're talking to the one and only Mike Jaminski right now on the Delano Little Show. Bayhawkle Sports presents the Delano Little Show. Welcome to the Delano Little Show. We are honored and privileged to have with us today former Duke star, NBA star, broadcaster, Mike Jaminski. I, we've, we've known each other for, for many years, and it's, mm -hmm. it's good to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, it has, Delano. And, uh, you know, we're, we're in the same industry and doing kind of the same thing. But, uh, you know, we go back to my first time here in Charlotte. Uh, so it's great to be with you here. Well, um, let's talk a little bit about your, your college career at, at Duke. Uh, won Rookie of the Year, mm -hmm. uh, also Player of the Year. That's that's pretty impressive to be in the ACC and win win those two awards. Yeah, you know, and again, I you know I look at it that there are no individual awards. Um, you know, I played on some really great teams and had a lot of great talent around me. And and any one of those years, you know, in consecutive years, Jim Spinarco won Rookie of the Year. I won Rookie of the Year. Gene Banks won Rookie of the Year. Some big names, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, that's the type of players that we had on that team. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to be a part of that. And when we kind of brought Duke back to where it was under Vic Bubis in the 60s, uh, you know, they went to four Final Fours, uh, were nationally ranked. And, uh, you know, we, we brought that back, and it was great to be a part of it. Well, um, you, you al and you almost had a shot. You almost yeah. pulled off a national championship. I, I would imagine that was, that was tough with yeah, you know, I mean, the, the losses really stay with you, especially, you know, you go through that whole thing. And, and that year was a magical year for us in 78 when, um, you know, we beat North Carolina, who was number three in the country in the regular season, won the ACC tournament, uh, went through the, uh, and so it was all of our first NCAA tournament experience. Right. And we find ourselves in the finals. Um, <laughs> And took, took down Notre Dame, right? Yeah, you, we you beat, we beat Notre Dame in the semis, and, uh, you know, here we are playing for the national championship. And uh, a guy named Jack Givens had the game of his life right? In, in, at the exact right time. Right. Um, and, you know, that being said, we, we only lost by six, and it's still the highest scoring game in NCAA finals history, yeah. you know, with no shot clock, no three-point shot. Lost to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was a tough one. Uh, mm. A lot of people don't like Kentucky. I know North Carolina <laughs> fans don't. I know Duke fans don't either. That, that. <laughs> well, I think that may have been the start of the rivalry. Uh, you know, they did play a little bit in the 60s. Of course, Jeff Mullins, a great Duke player, is from Lexington. And then Vince Taylor, a guy who played on our team, is from Lexington, you know, coming to Duke. Uh, right. But it's, it's, it's a great, great rivalry. You, you have the privilege of having something happen to you that not a lot of people in the, in the, I would say in the world, have. And well, let's just let's just go with this. My number was 80 at Georgia Southern, mm -hmm. and people can still wear it. It has not been retired yet, yeah. but yours has. I mean, that, what was that like to, to have your number 43 retired? There? Um, again, it was a t you know I view it as a team thing, but um, no number had been retired since Dick Groat's number in '52. And there were a lot of great players, you know, you know, I mentioned Jeff Mullins, Art Heyman, National Player of the Year, Jack Marin, Jimmy Spinarkle the year before me. So I was really, they, and they surprised me with it. It was, it was done before our last home game against Clemson, the last regular season game. And right. I was so you did, had, no, had no idea? No, okay. none. And I was, com I, I was completely overwhelmed emotionally for the first 10 minutes of the game, got myself together, <laughs> and, you know, we wound up winning in overtime. But... Um, just a fabulous honor, and then Johnny Dawkins after me, and all the you know the great players that that Mike Krzyzewski has had. Uh, it's a it's a very special fraternity to be a part of. Well, that's interesting. Most people know they're going to have their number retired, but they have that that, that uh, and then now you can look back on it and think, oh, it was more special to me now mm -hmm. because it was a surprise. Yeah, right? and well, and a after the game, I told them, I said, look, if you're going to honor anybody. Again, tell them that it's going to happen, <laughs> right. or do it after they've left, so they can enjoy the whole, you know, moment. Uh, right. So the the process did change. Well, you did not play for Coach Mike Krzyzewski, mm -hmm. uh Very close, to, but to that, but you developed a friendship with him as mm -hmm. well. 
Yeah, and uh, you know, it was a surprise, and I've told people, I said, in today's circumstance, you probably couldn't have made that higher because we had returned to being a national program. We were ranked number one, and here they hired this guy from Army who had a losing record at right. Army to take over. Um, and the first couple of years were, were really rocky, and a lot of the fan base wasn't, you know, they, they weren't on board with Mike. And uh, we had a very strong athletic director in Tom Butters who stayed with him. Um, and then he got the class with Johnny Dawkins and Jay Billis and Mark Allery, and things took off from there. But it was, it, it was close, and it took a strong athletic director to hang in with him. I agree. Well, uh, he, now here's the deal. My producer, mm -hmm. uh, Angie, uh, is, uh, went to North Carolina, She's a Tar Heel fan. But usually in the tournament, I will talk to her, and she'll say if, if somebody, if like, let's say Tar Heels go out, and Duke's still in. She says, guess I'm pulling for Duke now, <laughs> which, which that doesn't happen very often. And some, some people will go for anybody else except yeah. the opposite team, right? Well, and I, I told her I, I almost didn't do this show because of her allegiance <laughs> to North Carolina. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I did. I, I, just yeah. because of you, I came in. No, yeah. I'm only teasing. Yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, you know, this, the fascinating thing about coming down here and learning about the rivalry is the, the mixed marriages and the family divisions and people having to go into different rooms and watch that <laughs> game. Uh, it, it's special. You know, it, it really has been fabulous to be a part of that rivalry. Yes, and, and arguably uh, the biggest rivalry in obviously college basketball, but some may, may think it's the biggest rivalry of all time. Yeah, and it, those are tough. I mean, you've got, you know, Michigan, Ohio State, Red Sox, Yankees. Uh, you know, there are great rivalries in every sport, and, and I never get into the GOAT conversation. I don't get into – there's so, there's it's so many It's hard to compare, other, right? It, hmm? It's kind of hard to compare. Yeah, it, it stuff, really yeah. is. But uh, and when you're a part of something like that, uh, I mean, just there's so much – history and to be a part of it is, re is really an honor. All right. So you, 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 you graduate, you're, you're, you're ready to go on you're, you're to the NBA, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about your NBA career coming up uh, in the next, next uh, coming commercial break, after we take a commercial break. We're also mm -hmm. going to talk about uh, some other things that went on in your life that's very important to you, okay. and I think will be able to help other people as well, okay? Sounds good. So uh, stay right there. Uh, we're talking with Mike Jaminski, and we'll be right back here on the Delano Little Show. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Delano Little Show. Uh, again, here with Mike Jaminski, former Duke star, uh, NBA star, broadcaster. Let's talk about your NBA career because uh, 14 years, mm -hmm. 14 years of uh, being down low and guarding some of the great people. And uh, I think I saw a picture of uh, you uh, with Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Uh, who was the toughest that you had to face? Him. I mean, without, it, without question. Well, Elijah Wan was maybe a close second, not a close second, but second. Wow. Um, but Kareem was just... Uh, what made him so special? Just his size and uh, the, the, that hook shot is the single most unstoppable offensive weapon in the history of the game, I still believe. And I was front and center for a lot of it. Yeah. Um, There's just really nothing you could do with it. Once he went into his shooting motion, I'm, you know, I got the best seat in the house. I'm standing underneath him watching. Um, but he was he was stronger than people give him credit for. I mean, he looked really lean, but um, very strong. Uh, he took a brutal punishment every game because the referees, you know, if they called every foul that you tried to do guarding him, the, you know, the game would slow down to a crawl. Right. But just an amazing, amazing player offensively. Um, and, you know, Magic was epitomized that team, but without Kareem, Back then, the playoff game became a half-court game, and everything centered around him. Wow. Uh, so you drafted in the first round, mm -hmm. uh, and New Jersey Nets, but you, your career spanned four teams, and you had the Charlotte Hornets tied in there. What was your time like with the Charlotte Hornets, and was it special enough for you to want to stay here in Charlotte? Yeah, you know, it was, it was interesting. My best teams were in Philly. And being traded from Philly here, that was devastating to me just because, you know, I'm still good friends with Charles Barkley and Rick Mahorn. Those teams were like my, my Duke teams. Gotcha. You know, we're still very close. Wow, okay. 
So I come down here and, you know, I was looking. I, I remember when I first got here, I was shooting free throws after practice and uh, J.R. Reed and, and Rex. Right, were, Rex Chapman. Yeah, you know, we were talking and they asked me, you know, when, when did you come into the league? And I said, well, I was a rookie in 1980. And they looked at each other and go, man, we were in the eighth grade. <laughs> you know, so the focus of the team, it was new. Um, right. The atmosphere was fabulous at the Hive. Um, and then... Right after that time, you know, is when they had the draft uh, picks. So they got Kendall Gill, and then they got Larry Johnson, and then they got Alonzo Mourning. Mm -hmm. And that really was the foundation of that team taking a jump up right, yes. in, in the franchise. So I was, I was there to be a part of it. I mentored Zoe some at, at center. Um, my playing time diminished. But that really, the trade here set up the rest of my life. Right. Uh, which has been amazing. Yes, and then you you get into broadcasting. I mean, mm -hmm. that, uh, a natural leap. And uh, by the way, very uh, one of the best broadcasters I've, I've, I've seen. You. I'm not just saying that because I feel like <laughs> we're friends. Um, what was broadcasting like to you, and how how has it affected your life? It's, you know, it was it was funny that um, Steve Martin hired me, and um, long time a long time, long time voice, for the Hornets, yeah. Yes. And so I. Uh, you know, a guy named Matt Pinto was doing the radio at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, I was—I did my first two years on radio, which all the old-time guys, you know, I talked to Marv Albert, and everybody said they need—you start on radio. That's what you need to do: build your base there, and then go to television. So Matt and I, he said, just meet me down at the practice facility down at Fort Mill. So we went down there, we put a game tape on, and we did a mock broadcast right. for a half. And he said, "You're fine." I'm like. Okay. That was, <laughs> you know, that was, that's that, pretty good. That's right? my training. Yes, and, uh, yes. So then I remember that first game. You know, we had a we went on the air at six thirty on WBT, and we had a we had a half hour national kind of NBA uh, show, and then we did a half hour pregame show, then we did the game, and then we had a half hour wrap up. So it was right. four hours. Yes, it's, it, and Delano, I I have never been as tired as I was <laughs> at the end of that first night. I, right. It was a it was an exhibition game with the Detroit Pistons and Grant Hill's rookie year. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And I was I was wiped out after the broadcast. Yeah. Um, but it's it's been a it's been a great ride. People don't understand. I think for broadcasters that when you when you do that, there is a toll on you mentally because you mm -hmm. have to be in it all the time you don't want to make a, a, a terrible mistake on the air it's going to come back at you and people never forget that kind of stuff you yeah and, and even you know back then and and as i learned in the acc that people will watch the game on tv but they'll listen on radio and and i tell people i i loved my time on radio right because it didn't happen unless we said so you know it's a very powerful medium from that perspective and i used to love growing up listening to sports on radio i mean that's a lot of games weren't televised Absolutely. so yes. you know, listen to yankees on you know the knicks you know growing up in that area uh, but it was great training for me all right uh, what are we gonna do we'll take a break okay i'll come back because i i, I want to give enough time to talk about something that's very important in your life okay. uh, and we'll talk more about that coming up in just a second we're back on the delano little show right after this <laughs> Welcome back to the Delano Little Show. We are here with uh, Mike Jeminski, former uh, college star uh, the, with the Duke Blue Devils, uh, NBA star with uh, four teams, four different teams, I believe. Correct? Four different teams. I I I, I kind of count Milwaukee, but that was for that was for two months. At I got the end you. Of my I got career. you. I, I was I wasn't exactly Giannis up there. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, and 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 broadcaster, and you've mm -hmm. done so well with with that uh, after your career and on the on on the court. Uh, but some of the things that you're doing now off the court is probably some of the most important work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point in your career, you went off track as far as alcohol was concerned. Mm -hmm. And you, you said, was, you want to speak to that? I mean, you, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I was, a, I was a social drinker. Some would say a very social drinker. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's in our industry that, you know, you, you, you broadcast, you go out and do games, and, uh, you know, you go to dinner and you have a couple of cocktails and some wine. And Let me just tell my mother that I don't do that. <laughs> I never saw <laughs> Delano do that, so I will back him up on no, that. But, I, it, but, um, but, yeah, and then I, I, I faced, uh, I, I went through a very rough stretch in my life that culminated in the death of my fiance, who was, you know, she was 23 years younger than me. And, right. 
and I short-circuited. I and rather than seek professional help, I decided to self-medicate. Uh, it was the athlete, the arrogance in me that said, you know, I can handle this. I can take care of it myself. Right. And things started to spiral out of control for me. Um, my drinking got worse instead of, you know, hitting a natural conclusion. Uh, my teammates at Duke in 2017 tried to have a intervention for me. I wasn't ready to hear the message at that time. And uh, came up to COVID, you know, lockdown, was basically in my apartment drinking all day long. And my son was there front and center for it all, Noah. And he finally got to the point where he had an intervention for me. And I was ready to, to hear the message and more importantly, to hear it from him. Right. Um, and I was begging for somebody to help me internally at that point. And thank God it was him. And uh, went into treatment in July of, of 2020. Right. And that was with Jason Williams, with your former mm -hmm. teammate there in New Jersey? Yeah, I, I, went, I went down to detox in Florida. And then he's got a facility down there uh, called Rebound. Uh, it's funny, Jason was a rookie with uh, Charles and myself in Philly. Right. Um, and he had a very... A, a tough past that people know you know a lot about Absolutely. but he went into recovery decided to open up his place and I found my way back to him um, was down there for 60 days came back here to Charlotte was in an outpatient program for about six months and uh, I continued my broadcasting that year and on July 14th of this year, it'll be three years uh, of sobriety for me. Oh, congratulations. So you, went, you. you know, so many people say that they're having those kind of problems try to get out of themselves and they feel like they can, sometimes they need mm -hmm. help. Yeah. You know, I, I have never seen anybody who has, you know, gotten to the place where you're really dark where I was and, and be able to do that by yourself. Um, and you just you just have to come to the conclusion and you have to surrender to it right. uh, and be ready to hear the message and it's it's got to be the right voice at the right time um, and then you have to be committed to improving yourself right. um, my, my walk with Christ has been a huge part of my recovery as well um, but you know with, with his strength and, and with my son and the accountability that I have of all the people around me. Delano, I was so lucky. I didn't lose one person of my group. And I've got so many people who wanted that for me, right. you know, leading up to my, you know, leading up to that intervention. And they were so happy that I was, that I took that step and they've been there every step of the way for me. I understand a part of your, uh, Rehabilitation was jumping out of an airplane. Is that <laughs> <laughs> what was that like when you yeah. go back again? You know, <laughs> it was it was funny that um, it, that is part of the program. It's it's adventure therapy is what they call it, and they right. do things to get you outside of your uh, comfort zone, which that certainly was. And I was adamant I wasn't going to do it. Uh, everybody in the program had, you know, gone skydiving, so they they waited for my second thirty days down there to <laughs> to, you know, let me work into that. I you know I. I agreed. I went up, uh, and it was as liberating a thing as I've ever done. Wow! And when I did that, it was like recovery became possible for me. You know that, that I overcame the fear of jumping out of a perfectly good airplane <laughs> with a guy I'd never met before on my back to pull a chute. Right. Yeah. Um, but we landed, and it was it was an unbelievable experience. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. And we uh, we're going to take a break, okay. and then we we'll come back. And I want to hear because you want to do some things that will help other people mm -hmm. here closer to home in Charlotte. Okay, we're going to talk about that? Sounds good. All right, we'll be right back with Mike Chaminsky on the Delano Little Show. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Delano Little Show here again with uh, Mike Jaminski, former Duke player, former NBA player, uh, broadcaster, uh, and probably the most important thing, uh, recovered alcoholic, if, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just talking about that in the break before. You now have the chance to help other people, and you, and, and you want to do that because you've been – for the last two years, you've been going back to see Jason Williams, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah, and uh, it, it's really been a great experience for me to go back to Rebound and, and be a peer mentor there, and to you know to be in groups and and being a part of counseling from the other side of somebody who's been through the program. And 
Um, I, I just feel now that my calling is to come back to North Carolina, come back here, and to help, uh, to be of service. You know, one, one, to me, one of the most powerful scenes in the Bible is the night before the crucifixion when Christ washes the feet of his disciples to show him what servitude is. Right. And that's what I want to be. I want to be, I want to wash feet. I want to help people who are reluctant to come out about a problem they may have. I want to help family members because it is very, very difficult it for them. It wraps everybody, doesn't it? It does. It, it I mean, you think when you're in the middle of it that you're only affecting yourself, but you're not. And, um, and, and I just, you know, wh whatever age range it is, whether it's high school kids, um, you know, going and getting involved with FCA and talking to groups of, of high school students, um, uh, you know, middle-aged, older people in, uh, you know, I was, I was 60, 61 when I went into recovery. Right. It's, it's never too late. Right. to do that, yes. to make a choice. And, and frankly, Most people, people don't think about going that, that it, old, yes. Yeah, and you, you, can have, you can make one of two choices. You can say, all right, I'm, I'm close to the end, I'm out. Or you can fight. And, right. you know, I, I did it for myself, I did it for my son. And, um, you know, and I, I don't want to, you know, whatever age range it is, uh, you know, I want, I want to, the conversation to surface, to have people not be self-conscious or feel weak about seeking help. Right. All right, well, I, I, enough about that. I, you, you've been so gracious to talk about that. I don't want to beat that to it, but, but let's go back to your, your days of playing. Mm -hmm. uh, any memorable moments that stand out at you as far as, uh, let's say, college basketball? College, uh, 78 was just so special. Uh, I talked about the game where we beat North Carolina. Uh, they came to Cameron as the third ranked team in the country. and. And they had beaten Duke 17 of 18 games before then. Wow, I didn't know that. So okay. the rivalry really had gone away. It wasn't much of a rivalry. Right. You know, we resurrected that. And in that game, I think we came at afterwards and thought, you know, we can really be special. You know, we, and that was the springboard for us, you know, winning the ACC championship, which was a, a, another, it was a nationally televised game on Wide World of Sports. And just to show you now, every game is a nationally televised game now. <laughs> right, yes. But, um, yeah, and then, you know, going through the tournament and, uh, you know, so all of that, um, my Jersey retirement obviously was a, was a very special night for me. Uh, and then, you know, before that winning the ACC or after that winning the ACC championship again. Right. My senior year. So we played, we played in the finals three straight years. We lost to Carolina in the finals in 79, but uh, won twice. So we had a good run in Greensboro. And you kind of kicked everything off to Duke being great again, too, right? I mean, you yeah. have to think that as a team. We kind of felt that way. We won two national championships in mm -hmm. Georgia Southern, and then won four more. And you feel like you were part of putting the blood, sweat, and tears to mm -hmm. help the program. Yeah, very much so. And, and like I said, people overlooked the Vic Bubis years. Um, and the 60s were a very good time for Duke basketball. Um, and then, you know, to to bring it back in the 70s and you know what what Mike did after that start was you know just beyond Absolutely. description with the five national championships and most wins ever as a college coach. Mike Jaminski, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for sharing everything that you did with us today. Delano, it's great to be back with you. We've been uh, in the city for a long time together and uh, always great to spend time. All right, that's all the time we have for the Delano Little Show. We hope to see you again next time.